You don't want to be out doing anything else anyway, right? right. Me neither. Yeah, can, yeah, I want to be here. Uh, thank you for the announcements, Cheryl. Good job. Thank you, Brian, for all you do. Uh, Xavier Delaray. Xavier Delaray. This came in just a few weeks ago. Uh, just a fresh produce, so just a brand new story. He had a sensory processing disorder. In 2015, he was a new little baby, uh, but was beyond normal happy, would light up the room wherever he was. They called him Sunshine. He would just uh, light up rooms everywhere. Uh, his parents were Isaac and Mara. And, um, and then between the age of one and two, he had vaccine shots, a series of vaccine shots. Parents weren't in that particular case informed as far as what the shots were, what they're getting, he is getting. Uh, but he ended up with uh, black pinprick dots all over his body, platelet, platelet levels really low, uh, and required transfusions, which they weren't aware. There were things going on with him they weren't aware of, parents weren't. Uh, he entered into a three-year decline following that in his health. He became hostile. Uh, toward the world at large, uh, little Xavier did as a baby. Uh, his speech, he was, uh, the doctor had mentioned, man, he, he's well advanced in speech. Now he lost his speech. They couldn't tell uh, what he was saying. Uh, a lot of pain, a lot of digestive issues. He was what they determined was vaccine injured. Uh, they, mom and dad lost trust in uh, their medical help at the time. I'm not against medical help. Thank God for medical help. It, it helps us to survive while we grow in faith, right? It's good to have medical help around. Uh, but they lost their trust and through extensive research they found out what he had was sensory processing disorder. He, he began to fight everything. If you wanted to brush his teeth, it was an all-out fight. If you uh, put him in a car seat, it was a fight. If you wanted to cut his hair, uh, if you want to wipe the tears from his face, it was a fight. Uh, he actually hated everybody, and uh, he would torment the dog if he could. And his mom and dad heard uh, some teaching from Andrew, and this is a quote, that most people believe that God can heal, but they don't know that he already has. God has already done his part. And uh, this was, and for some reason, the light dawned on them. It's one thing to, oh yeah, yeah, I can agree with that. It's another thing uh, that it becomes your revelation. You own it now. That happened, and because they saw that, they began to celebrate, uh, even though nothing had changed yet. You know, they just, so much so, that little Xavier at four and a half years of age starts rocking around the house going, by his stripes I am healed, by his stripes I am healed. And you'd say, God is good, God is good, God is good. You know, now nothing had changed but uh, except for their excitement that it was all true. Uh, so they went to a conference where Andrew was ministering. She of course wanted to bring Xavier up and have Andrew pray for him. Uh, Xavier was not cooperative because he, all of his senses were highly sensitive. He, he couldn't stand the noise, he couldn't stand the people. Uh, his dad was fighting with him out in the foyer, just trying to keep him under control. And uh, mom realized this isn't going to work. The lady that was trying to hook people up with people to pray for them uh, said, sorry, uh, I, don't, I don't think this is going to fly today. And, uh, and brought over a woman that looked so commonplace, it was another mother. She seemed totally unimpressive. But she said, uh, she said this to the mom. To Mara. She said, I command that infirmity to leave his body now. And, uh, and all of a sudden, Xavier jumped out of his dad's arms and crossed, I don't know if I can do it, crossed his legs back and forth, crisscrossed his legs a couple times, and then headed off into a dance, which he never did. He, he began acting like a normal boy, totally unlike himself. They wanted to go in where the conference was, and there was singing going on, so they open the door and Xavier goes like that, which would be normal for him to do. And uh, then he looked around, pulled his hands down, ran in the room and began singing at the top of his lungs. He was healed from that moment on. Yeah, yeah.
His speech still took a little while to relearn how to talk. His digestion took about four months to get normal, but he eats everything now. Uh, Bianca Blastuen and her husband Gert, Gert from Norway, uh, she had rod cone dystrophy and she grew up as a child in Norway. She began, her eyes began to be, uh, vision began to be interfered with. She went over a 20 year uh, work erosion of her vision. It became blurrier and the field began to close until finally in her last eye exam in 2008, her vision was at 15%. It was like looking through a straw uh, and then blurry on the other end. So uh, somebody, uh, and it was incurable. It's going to go all the way out. So this little pinpoint uh, view. And so somebody gave them uh, teachings, uh, spirit, soul, body. God wants you well. You've already got it. And, uh, and, for, and she was home listening. And all of a sudden, revelation came. All of a sudden, she knew it was hers. Nothing had changed. She just knew it was hers. She began to praise God, thank God. Nothing changed yet. It's like the lady with a goiter after three years. I am, you know, she kept telling me, I'm so healed. The goiter is sitting there. You know, I'm, I'm so healed. They go, no, you aren't. But she knew she was. She didn't, didn't have, it, have to have it go away. She knew she was. And finally she begged God, God, take it away just, true story, take it away just so they can know too. And, and she woke up the next morning without a goiter. And she went and showed them and, because, uh, but she knew she didn't need it to go. She knew it was gone. So uh, uh, Bianca was praising and thanking God and she said, this is quote, eyes, God doesn't need to heal you. He already healed you. You must see, you must see, you know. <laughs> so, and she told her eyes that. And all of a sudden, the blurriness and clarity began to fluctuate. Go boom, 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 boom the field of vision began to broaden and narrow and broaden and narrow you know so everything's just going mobile in her eyes she closed her eyes again and she began to praise God and thank God again just because she knew it was already true she already knew it was true there's knowing and then there's knowing and what we want is the knowing in our heart we want it to get out of our brain down into our heart it takes the Holy Spirit's help to do that and uh, but she told her eyes again while she's praising God, you are healed in Jesus' name. She opened her eyes and uh, the clarity was total. It was complete. She was healed. Yeah. She went down and got Gert. Gert, you wouldn't believe you. You know, I can't do the Nor Norwegian thing. Come on, Kim. Oh, it's fun to watch you try. <laughs> and, like my crisscross dance. Uh, so uh, there were twice since then that uh, all of a sudden her eyes went blurry and the field closed and and she understood by that point in time you don't lose your healing you don't lose a healing God gives you but the enemy is going to come knock on the door and see if he can get in again like he got in the first time and so uh, her eyes would do that thing and instead of panicking she said no nope, I'm closed she's talking to the enemy I am healed eyes uh, you must see in Jesus name and and beyond those two times she's been 20 20 plus ever since perfectly healed I want to talk to you today about a word imputation imputation uh, you're going to get theological before today's done but I, I think uh, very, today's very important there's a Greek word for imputation which is logizomai logizomai is the Greek word and uh, and it means logic uh, it's the word that we get logic from or logistics from it's from logos and it means to count reckon compute calculate credit to credit to calculate to count that's imputation so Romans chapter 4 Every time I put my hand up like this, go logizomai. Can, can we practice oh, logizomai? Logizomai. Logizomai. That's a good Greek word to remember. 
Romans 4 verse 3 through 8. What, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted. Logizomai. To him for righteousness. Several things here. He believed. Uh, in, in school we would have these little tests where there's a football, a baseball, and a golf ball. Then there's a penguin. Now, which, what doesn't fit this group? You know, oh, the penguin doesn't fit. Now, when God is saying he logizmized, he imputes, it's how he sees things, how he calculates things, how he figures things. So here, uh, God, Abraham believed and God logizmized it, calculated it with righteousness. He packaged righteousness and Abraham's believing. Verse 4, now to him who works, the wages are not counted, logizmai, not counted, as grace, but as a debt. And so here are several words, works, wages, debt, uh, God sees in a group. That's how he figures it. Grace doesn't fit that group. Grace is the penguin in that case. Uh, verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted. Logizmai. Logizmai. Thank you. Logizmai for righteousness. So you have a grouping here in God's calculations, in God's mathematics. You have doesn't work, believes, has faith, and is righteous. All in a group. They go together. Uh, verse 6. Oh, we were there. Verse 6. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom, and I'll show you several times, when God imputes righteousness to somebody, it is to them. It's not just something going on up in heaven in God's brain. He uh, imputes to you. He imputed to Abraham. And we'll see how he does that. And actually gave Abraham something. You'll see that in a minute. To him who does not work, uh, but just as David describes the blessed of the men to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute yeah impute sin so here is a stunning if, if you don't just read this verse but think about it most of Christians can accept the fact that my sins have been forgiven yeah I'm forgiven I'm forgiven I'm forgiven all past tense and then if you sin again you have to get forgiven again you sin again you have to get forgiven again if you for, if you fail to confess one you may be in trouble but you just keep on getting for, uh, forgiven here he's he's saying there's something beyond that blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not future tense future tense fu shall not impute he shall not count he shall not calculate he shall not figure he is sin against that man and and David says that's blessed so do you understand you've been forgiven on the one hand do you also understand that God will not impute future tense sin against you? Uh, isn't that good news? Well, how could God forgive past, present, and future sin if in fact he does? It's because he forgave them all 2,000 years ago while they were all future. Well, Bob, do you believe in confession? I do, I do, I do. I believe you can be a grace person and believe in confession because 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess God forgives you know etc but you have in first John chapter 1 you have him calling people into fellowship come on into the fellowship we have with father son chapter 2 he begins talking directly to believers the end of chapter 1 he's saying if you confess your sins God will forgive them etc I confess my sins when I recognized I needed a savior I am doomed I'm a sinner I need a savior Bob, are you going to confess your sins? Yes. Were you forgiven your sins? Yes, I was. Bob, was that the last time you confessed your sins? No, I'm confessing my sins all the time. But why I'm confessing them is not to get forgiven. God shall not impute my sins against me. 
In other words, the relationship with God doesn't go, you know, it just, God's on. God's on. He's not imputing sins against us. And uh, so do you confess your sins? Yes, I do, but not to get forgiven. I confess my sins because I know I am forgiven, because I know God loves me, because I know he accepts me, and I can go get this icky problem solved with his help. So I'll, I'll say, God, I'm sorry. I blew it. Man, I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge the truth with him. But part of my reason for doing so is I don't think I'm in disfavor now. He didn't impute it against me. Logizomai. Uh, Romans 4 verse 10. Isn't that good news? How, how then was it accounted? Logizomai. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Now he's saying, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised, this is important, this point. When do you, when do you get Logizomai going on? When do you get the imputation? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Now he's talking to the Jews about the law and circumcision, but it also applies to New Testament. The Bible says that we aren't circumcised by a circumcision done by hand, but we're circumcised, Philippians 3.3, 3, because we worship God in spirit, because we boast in Jesus Christ, and because we put no confidence in the flesh. Now what I'm going to show you is God has called imputed righteousness on people before their circumcision. The circumcision was the sign and the evidence that they were made righteous. Your believing in Jesus Christ, worshiping God by the Spirit, and putting no confidence in the flesh is a wonderful thing. But I'll tell you, the, the righteousness came to you before you did those things. They opened up the door so you couldn't do those things. Am I confusing you? Stay on, we're getting theological here. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal, a proof, of, an evidence of the righteousness of the faith which he, what? Which he had. See, when we're talking about uh, imputation, we're talking about more than a math problem in God's mind in heaven. He imputed, he gave imputation to Abraham, and Abraham had it. What did he have? A righteousness by faith. Before there was any evidence that he had a righteousness by faith. I love this stuff. Uh, that he might be the father of those who believe, though they are circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed. Logizmai. Thank you, Brian. You're so good at this stuff. Romans 4, 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. So he said 12 months before he had Isaac. Now, is this true or not? What's God saying? When God says, by his stripes you were healed. Is that a mental game? So what's it mean? I'm not healed. You were healed. I'm not healed. You were. Oh, no, my arm's broken. Yeah, in the natural realm it is. But in God's imputation of healing, I was healed. Past tense, done. I have made you a, the father of many nations. This is imputed fatherhood. In the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which don't exist as though they do exist. Don't you love this stuff? Yes. Isn't the word of God exciting? Yes. I want to know how, I want to know the mechanics of faith. I want to know how healing works. Well, Bob, you're giving us the bottom line today. I'm not even close to... I'm just barely getting my toes wet as far as understanding healing. I'm, you know, we're just getting started, folks. So, uh, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver. This word is diacrino. And it's the word, it's the word doubt. And what it literally means is back and forth deciding, judging, discerning, to doubt, hesitate, to vacillate. A double-minded man is unstable. You're standing there and you're, you see the promise of God. 
and you see the dead body that you are and you see the promise of God and you see the dead body and God says you're the father of nations and you see your dead body and God says stop looking at the dead body hold on to the promise and don't waver and so the trial of faith is this are you going to go rrm, rrm? is the wind going to come make you go rrm? or are you going to be able to stand there and not even waver because you have something imputed to you and you know you have it enough that you'll sing and dance and say I'm healed I know I'm healed see this kind of faith is not a mental game it's a knowledge it's it's seeing into the spiritual realm let us draw near with the tr let's see where are we okay I'm ahead of myself being fully convinced it was accounted to him for righteousness imputation imputation is God's ability this is my definition to speak into existence spiritual realities speak them into being in the spirit realm or dimension that are not yet existent and not yet manifest in the natural or physical realm or dimension I have made you not yet in the natural he didn't have a child yet I but past tense I already made you a father of many nations imputation is God superseding natural realities by speaking into existence superior spiritual realities that on our part only need to be seen with spiritual eyes take spiritual eyes to see them for agreement with God you know you try believing without seeing into that imputed realm and uh, your mind just cannot hold on to it your mind will go <laughs> constantly to see with spiritual eyes I have imputed righteousness to see it and then number two to draw it out through your unwavering faith not just faith unwavering faith everybody that's a believer has faith the same faith the apostles have. you have faith the problem isn't getting faith or not the problem is whether you doubt and waver while you have faith we don't need more faith we need less doubt right. we need less wavering we need the ability to lock but that that takes the Holy Spirit drawn out into our words and actions that provide the human cooperation we don't get anything from God it's been given from God but we can cooperate with it or not so human cooperation through our words and actions into God's already accomplished work last week talked about there being a, a holy alliance between forgiveness and righteousness and an unholy alliance with sin and sickness they go together sickness is to your body what sin is to your soul you come to Christ he forgives your sins your spirit the spirit you get see your old spirit dies on the cross with Jesus Christ that's the sinful spirit the new spirit that you receive when you receive Jesus never sinned never has sinned when you got it never will sin while you have it off into eternity it never sins the spirit that's in you is an unsinnable spirit it can't sin um, it's righteous so your soul however because it still sins also is counted you logizomai reckon calculate as righteous by God your spirit doesn't have to be counted righteous it actually is your soul doesn't look so righteous and God says I'm going to count it righteous he imputes righteousness to your soul undeserved apart from your behavior how can he impute righteousness to a person who commits sin now all of this it takes a spiritual mind to see it for those that can't see what I'm saying it'll be over in a little bit just kind of hang in there <laughs> how can God impute impute I'm going to count you righteous how can he do that to a person who commits sin listen in the exact same way that he imputed sin on Christ who had committed no sin 
He didn't have to do an evil work while he hung on the cross for God to put sin on him. How does God put righteousness on me? That way. <laughs> Just reverse it. That way. We who have sinned so much. In the same way, Christ not only was counted as the most sinful man that ever lived, but it was so real that he was treated as the most sinful man that ever lived. In just the same way, we who sin so much are counted by God as the most righteous people. You go, well, that's not fair. Not according to the flesh, but God has imputed it on us. And we are treated by God as the most righteous people that ever lived. Romans says, and sin will never be imputed against you. That's awesome. Uh, to your spirit, did God have to, no, he didn't have to impute to your spirit. Your spirit's never sinned. So what sins? What do you think sins? Your soul, your body, they sin. Sin will never be accounted against by God. Because you're in Christ. Sin will never be accounted against your soul or body even when you sin. That's imputed righteousness. Your soul and body, how many are just going, oh, I won't even ask, never mind. Your soul or body are counted righteous in spite of sins. Now Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed. Your soul is taken. You want fellowship with Jesus? You're going to have it to the degree you understand you've got a sprinkled soul and you've got a washed body. Your spirit is pure. That's the only kind of spirit God would ever give you. It's always been spirit, pure. But regarding your heart, Peter said regarding the Gentiles uh, that were receiving the spirit, he says, he told the Jew, Jews in Jerusalem that God purified their hearts by faith, just like he did for us. God purified their souls. When you were saved, your soul was purified. How? By imputed righteousness, in spite of sin. It's a gift. And with your mortal body that's so prone to misdeeds, this doesn't, I'm not telling you to go out and sin, I'm just telling you where God's at amidst it all. Uh, it's washed with pure water, the Bible says. That it is the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit lives in you despite its proneness to sin. It's a gift. Righteousness is a gift. Apart from works, it's a presently existent spiritual reality. Your righteousness is a presently existent spiritual rea reality. So, our invisible, imputed gift of righteousness, which God has counted and declared us to be, is the root. And our outward, visible, religious behavior, righteous, not religious, righteous behavior, our outward, visible, righteous behavior is the fruit of believing in the root. If you don't know you have imputed righteousness in spite of your sin, you're going to have a great deal of difficulty trying to get manifest behavioral change. We're not sinners trying to stop sinning. We're saints, holy, righteous, yes. spirit, soul, and body, fighting sin from a righteous position. We're not fighting sin from sin. We're fighting sin from a position of righteousness from a position of victory and not from a position of defeat. It's an imputed righteousness that we have. It had to be because we couldn't deserve it. That's the whole point. And out of faith in our God-given imputed righteousness, even amidst a sinful lifestyle, comes the fruit of a righteous lifestyle. How do you become such a good person? Well, it wasn't by determination, discipline, and heart. It was by faith. Yes. Faith in what? God has made me righteous. Right. And through faith in that imputed righteousness, you begin to live out the fruit of righteousness in your behavior. Now, what makes that possible? 
What turns the root, the invisible imputed righteousness, into the fruit, the visible lifestyle righteousness? What makes that possible? It's our continuity of faith. Our continuity of faith. Wigglesworth used to talk about a, a damn power plant putting out energy, sending it through cables over to the city. The whole city is lit up. One night it goes dark. They couldn't figure out what was wrong until they found a cat carcass on the lines between the dam and the city. Cat fried. But, uh, and he's saying, this is where doubt comes in. One doubt short circuits the faith. Short circuits the power. Like Abraham becoming fully convinced without wavering. Like the double-minded man that won't go, I believe, but, I believe, but, I believe. No, the buts go out. I just believe. You say, but Bob, how do I get there? And I go, that's a very good question. I've been working on that one for about 70 years now. How do you get there? Remember the three cabins? Holy Spirit's there at the steps to walk you out to what God has already given you. Where you and Satan is there to blow, blow on you and cause a storm that will get you to shake on the way. Our only possible success in faith is with relationship with the Holy Spirit. By receiving in our friendship with Him, we're strolling hand in hand. We're not trying to be righteous. We're not trying to be healed. We're, we're walking. We're getting to know the Holy Spirit. He's getting to know us. We're fellowshipping with Him daily. We're praying in spirit. Go da 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 da. We're speaking in tongues. We're, we're generating a, 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 an inward fellowship with the Holy Spirit Himself. While you're in that position with the Holy Spirit, revelation becomes more ordinary to you. The ability to see your imputedness becomes more organic. It becomes easier for you. Uh, you're uh, receiving power by which you enforce the imputed righteousness through your words and actions. You're talking to the Holy Spirit. He's talking about You're talking to Him. Folks, we can walk our way out of any pit while we are talking to the Holy Spirit, He's talking back. It's my word that heals you. All we need is a word from the Holy Spirit to be healed. We've already got the scripture in our head. We need the Holy Spirit to speak to our heart to help us to know it in our knower. And then we receive from the Holy Spirit in relationship with Him. And we resist all the temptation to doubt. Because as I'll tell you, and I'll talk about sickness in a second, when we're talking about sickness and disease, we're talking about highly sensory problems. You get tinnitus, and it's going all day long. And my, well, this is not like cancer. It's not, well, I'll tell you, it's, it's coming at you through the sen natural senses. And you're trying to ignore the natural senses so you can move to the spiritual senses, and, or you're in pain. You know, sickness can be difficult because of the natural senses. So we take the truth of the gospel, scripture, we meditate. We take the Holy Spirit, we soften our hearts. We become responsive in our hearts. And we uh, receive revelation. And then we come into alignment without wavering by the Holy Spirit's help and we begin moving into cooperation. Meditation, revelation, cooperation, we have friendship with the Holy Spirit. We can walk out of any pit. It's a cooperative friendship. Now, what's this have to do with healing? You want to know what this has to do with healing? Everything. It's exactly the same. And we know, when we know how to receive righteousness, we know how health works by faith. They work the same. You come to Christ, He forgives all your sins. Is it real? Is your righteousness real or is it fake? Real. It's, thank you. Even without evidence, it's real. Even before the circumcision and you're trusting God, like, it's still real. Yes. Now, he heals all your diseases. Is it real? Yes. The imputed healing is also real. And it comes when you come to Christ. We know that our spirit's healthy. It came that way. But our bodies while they are still sick and subject to phys physical uh, affliction, they are also counted healthy by God. God has imputed health to you 
even while you're sick. How can he impute health to a sick body? In the same way that he imputed sickness and disease on Christ, who had never had a cough in his life, can you imagine? Went through every flu season, every cold season, never had a common cold. And he became the most diseased person that has ever existed. Now we are counted as the most healthy people that have ever existed. You say, well, that means nothing. I'll tell you, that's where faith comes from. If you don't understand imputation, you will not understand manifestation. And just as righteousness has been imputed to us and is a reality even when we sin in exactly the same way, health has been imputed to us even when we're sick. Righteousness came to Abraham. Righteousness comes to us. Health comes to us. It's just not up in heaven somewhere. It comes to us. Just as God said, I have made you, Abraham, a father to the nations. And he didn't have a child yet. It was imputed to him. He says to you, I have made you well. And we can stand on it as a reality. No, I am a father without a child. And now I am well with a sick body, but I am well. Your body is right now counted and declared by God to be healthy. In spite of your sickness. Your health is a gift apart from sickness, just like your righteousness is a gift apart from works. Are you righteous? Right now? In spite of sin? So are you healthy? We're not playing mind games. We're talking to God. Right now, are you healthy? In spite of sickness? God calls things that don't exist as though they do because they really do exist. Just in another realm. They really do exist. So, our imputed gift of health, what God has counted and declared to us, is the root, a healthy body, perfect up and down, inside out, front and back, is the fruit. We're not sick people trying to get well. If you see that, if you're trying to beat sickness from a position of sickness, relax. You might as well save your effort. But if you can see, Jesus has imputed health to me. I'm not a sick person trying to get well. I am a well, whole, healed person fighting off sickness. Then, then it's an imputed health you know that you have. And then out of your faith, that moves in your body and soul. What makes that possible? What makes that possible? Relationship with the Holy Spirit. Friendship with Jesus. It's not your, just your willpower. It's getting, the better you see Jesus, the better you see the whole spiritual realm. You see your righteousness, you see your health, and the more you see Jesus, the clearer your health becomes. And the more faith you can have. You're like Abraham, fully convinced without wavering. Because you see. You're going to the third cabin with the Holy Spirit's health to pull the healing out. Uh, in relationship with the Holy Spirit, you have revelation. You see the health. You have power. You enforce the health by the Holy Spirit's help. You're talking to him. He's talking to you. I believe I'm healed. I believe I'm healed. I believe I'm healed up here. Getting it down here. There's a point where the Holy Spirit... And it's not like I'm waiting for him to tell me. I'm waiting for me to be able to hear. I'll talk about that in a second. I'm almost done. And then you resist wavering. Meditation, revelation, cooperation. Now how long will it take? Well, Abraham's case took him 25 years. It doesn't have to take you 25 years. We've got an advantage over him. We're spirit-filled. But when it comes to sickness and health, every battle is different. I don't care whether it's a cold or whatever it is, whatever hits you. Uh, in Canaan, Jerusalem, uh, you go through a water shaft, Joab beats Jerusalem. Jericho, you blow trumpets, you go around it several times. Every battle was different. In your health, every battle is not going to be the same. 
because you have a different family history, you have different things that have been spoken to you, you have a different personal history, you have different demonic oppositions working on you, one way or the other. But you can develop a spirit mind steadiness even while your natural senses are bringing the pain and bringing the ringing and bringing whatever they bring. I'm going to close with this. Oh, we've got two scriptures. But I'll close with this. Aging. Why is aging a problem? Young folks, get ready, get ready, get ready. I've been where you are. Get ready, get ready. Aging. It's where your body becomes less resistant, you become more fragile, you get more uh, beaten up. So we need to learn these things. How many daughters of Sarah are in the room? Daughters of Sarah. Abraham and Sarah had this whole aging body does not stop God from imputing things to me. An aging body doesn't wear out the promises of God. When I'm 65, healing my body means one thing. When I'm 85, the promises aren't as true in the Bible, right? No. Just as true in the Bible. Abraham Sarah proved that against bodies that are as good as dead, she stood there and at the age of 90, pharaohs wanted her for their harem. I want that lady. So you daughters of Sarah stand up because God is able to fight back and resist those things that will own you and claim you. You sons of Abraham. The imputations of God overcomes everything. Uh, worship team, come on up. Here, thank you. The imputed gift can bring you out of any pit. John 16. These things I've spoken to you that in me you might have peace in the world, in the natural life. You will have trouble. And then he said this thing, be of good cheer, cheer, because I have overcome the world. Amen. Now he's about ready to die on the cross within hours. He says, be of good cheer. I've whipped this thing. What was he saying? He took on the human body. He took on the human soul. He took on the human life. He took on the human spirits. He took on the tests. He took on the challenges. He took on everything we could face. And he won it, and he won it, and he won it, and he won it, and he never lost, never once. And he says, don't be discouraged, guys. I beat this thing. What's he saying? You can beat this thing. I beat it. You can beat it. Last scripture. For whatever is born of God, read it with me overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith who is he that overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God now I look at that and go huh I have the faith that overcomes the world because I believe that Jesus is the Son of God he goes yep that's right. Anybody here else believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. He's saying you are designed and you have the capacity to beat the whole thing. Win every time. Get out of every pit. Why? It's been imputed to you. Amen.